My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and that means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again and I hope you enjoy. So on today's podcast, I'm happy to be hosting Rupert Russell, author of Price Wars, How Chaotic Markets Are Creating a Chaotic World, uh, which is available for pre-order online now on Amazon and other platforms and is officially released on the 27th of January. So just onto my first question, really, what influenced you to write the book? But um, that's a really good question. I had been wrestling with um, the question of sort of uh, global tumult or sort of global chaos for quite a while. Um, the first documentary film I made was called Freedom for the Wolf, which was sort of an examination of the decline of uh, freedom and democracy across the world. And we started making that in 2014. So that was really the first wave of the umbrella protests in Hong Kong. It was the failure of the Tunisian revolution to produce a government. It was the rise of uh, Modi in India. It was the rise of the first wave of the Black Lives Matter protests um, in the United States. That was all under Obama. Um, so we were sort of interested in what was causing this. What did, why was everyone, why were these freedom movements bubbling up everywhere? Where, why, why, in many cases, were they failing? And what was the face of this new kind of authoritarianism? And then as we sort of finished making that film, Trump got elected. And then Brexit happened. And then suddenly everything kind of went into overdrive. All these trends we've been kind of looking at and kind of been simmering away. I think on the periphery of the West, if, if not the West itself, suddenly were happening um, at the heart of, you know, the US, UK, Europe and so forth. And so I was still kind of interrogating this question of what sort of gone wrong. And I think from there, I just started digging into, you know, what caused, um, the Arab Spring, what caused Brexit, what caused um, the Trump election. And these things all started tying into one another. So you can't talk about Brexit without talking about the global refugee crisis. You can't talk about the global refugee crisis without talking about the civil wars in Yemen, Libya, and Syria. And of course, those all got started in the Arab Spring. So once you just start mapping out what was happening in 2016, everything kind of comes back in particular to the Arab Spring revolutions in 2010-11. Um, I'd happened to, I'd been to Tunisia, I'd done quite a bit of research on that, and I knew that there was some research that pointed it to being associated with food prices. And then once I started really digging down into what is a global food price price, who sets global food prices, um, what impact do food prices have around the world? Once you start asking those questions, it all started kind of unraveling. And I realized there was a much, much, much bigger story here. Um, and, and, and that was sort of the genesis of the project in 2017. Yeah, and I think that's quite interesting because, you know, we, we I guess a lot of people talk about how the last, you know, 50, 60 years has been very peaceful. But you think about all these, you know, type lots of volatility all around the world it just hasn't sort of elevated to that world war but yeah it's crazy to think how all that can be just linked to food prices as well as other prices of commodities as well but yeah but um yeah that's right they tend to have these cascading effects so there's sort of one of the big metaphors in the book that i talk about a lot is avalanches so you, you these sort of these sort of price spikes spark avalanches right they're not the whole thing it's obviously not the whole story but you're just sort of seeing again and again like just like in um um, you know, in Central Asia this Central Asia this week, we see again, it sort of begins with food prices, then it turns into riots and the government collapses. Then we have kind of foreign actors are involved and these things would have a tendency to kind of escalate and, and cascade. And I think that's the way to understand the last 10 years is a series of avalanches that are all sort of interrelated to, with each other. Yeah, definitely. And I, I like to think of it like if you, yeah, if you think of an avalanche, it starts with like a small piece and then it rolls. And then, as you said, it just gets to the point where it's this massive, you know, bunch of snow. But yeah, we can link that to the, to my next question, which is uh, really talking about the butterfly effect, which I think is, you know, a, a point that's mentioned at the start of the book, where it's basically what we're mentioning there, where these small things can really elevate into massive impacts all around the world. Uh, so can you maybe expand on this and, you know, how maybe what are some of these small stimulus or how can they have such big influences? Sure. So I was looking at this idea of, you know, the question was, you know, why is there so much chaos? And then once you begin with that, you've got to say, well, what is chaos? 
Um, where did this idea even come from? We have this idea of the butterfly effect, movies with Ashton Kutcher kind of running around. And there's this kind of misperception that chaos is about uh, the things being connected. So we live in this complex world, everything is connected and therefore something small over here could have a big impact over there. And actually that's not quite the point that the people who were sort of pioneering the mathematical applications of chaos theory in the 1970s and 80s were thinking about. Instead, how, how the mathematics work, and that's all these really are, they're very like toy little mathematical models that they're kind of playing around with, with very few elements, um, but yet can produce very complicated, intricate sort of effects. And that's what they were thinking about. They're thinking, in a given system, how does the system amplify something small into something big? And that's, and that's the key thing here. And we often talk about, for example, with social media, there's a lot of debate right now about, you know, Facebook or YouTube, and are they using algorithms to amplify, you know, the small little video made by a fringe conspiracy theorist in like Macedonia into being a huge hit, say, in the United States. And the key thing there is that Facebook or YouTube have developed these systems and these algorithms that do the amplifying. It's not organic or intrinsic to the process itself. And that similar thing that I was sort of to look at of saying, okay, what are the systems of, of amplification? How do you get a small climate shock? How does that become a big price spike? How does a riot um, in rural Tunisia become a regional revolution. And so I think when you look at chaos theory and the butterfly effect, really what you're looking for is systems of amplification. And what's so interesting about prices is that prices um, encapsulate all the rest. So take any kind of political risk that you that, that you could think about. You can think about migration, you could think about climate change, you could think about um, populist governments coming to power, maybe changing, I don't know, property laws or things like that that might freak out the financial markets, whatever that, or it could be, you know, a war in the Middle East or a conflict in Central Asia or the conflict between, uh, say, Taiwan and China, any one of these things, even though individually they can all grow from a small disturbance to a big, say, war or conflict or crisis in their own domain, they're all being so-called priced in. So, you know, your viewers, I'm sure, will be familiar with you watching you know, CNBC or Bloomberg. The anchors will be like the markets are pricing in this crisis, this conflict. And so everything kind of gets fed in to prices. So and, and often, you know, financial speculators will call this the risk premium. So, so this thing is all kind of very, very well developed in finance. And this is kind of, you know, if you look at hedge funds or banks, they have whole departments that are looking at risk, they're trying to price risk at, 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 accurately and that's sort of i think what makes prices such a fruitful thing to look at because it doesn't matter how many different causes there are whether it's climate change migration political instability war they all get fed fed into this single number and then the single number in turn can then create all kinds of catastrophes and you know, crises all of its own and so for me it was it was really fun to fruitful to write a book about prices because you could talk about everything and you can talk about everything that's happening in the world how chaos gets reproduced how it spreads how it amplifies all through something very simple which i think is in the essence of, of the butterfly effect and, and, and why people find it such a powerful metaphor yeah and i i found it really interesting when you were mentioning the book where you know it, they almost become self-fulfilling prophecies you know these investors they create this narrative they all go the same way and then it basically you know it goes the right direction so they think they're correct but they're really the people who've actually influenced that price change and maybe had that, those massive impacts on you know millions of people around the world yeah absolutely i track quite a few of these things um usually what they're doing is they're responding to uh narratives that are already out there so they don't usually create the narratives themselves although never say never i'm sure there's some out there especially look at things like currency speculation things like that i'm sure there's all kinds of weird things going on but usually what ends up happening is there's some sort of uh narrative it could be in it could be in the news it could be in the financial press um, and then this kind of gets picked up. And the usual way that we used to think about this was in this kind of, you know, um, folk psychology ideas that were kind of floating around that, you know, there were stories and they were sort of contagious and they kind of spread around and you get this kind of herd or kind of lemming like behavior. And it was often kind of blamed on human psychology. So you often hear, you know, people talking about behavioral economics and psychological biases and things like that. I think what's sort of interesting about that is it seems to me, um, perhaps the wrong way to think about things. True stories make sense, but what a lot of making the trades now are computers. 
So any kind of model that's based around human psychology, I think, is needs needs drastically updating. So what you actually now have is computers, AI, whatever it may be, machine learning, scanning the world, scanning headlines, scanning news data for any kind of disturbance there is, and then trading on it as as as, as quickly as possible. Because the premium in 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 speculation and finance is not to be right but to be first. And so this is what you see. So it's much, much better to say, OK, well, there could be a conflict here. Let's trade on it. Let's price it in before anybody else does. And if it doesn't, well, it doesn't really matter because everyone else will have jumped on the bandwagon as well. Everyone else is doing the same thing that, that um, we are. And, and, that, and that's really where the, and that's really where the uh, computers and the algos are kind of programmed into. And so when you talk to people who are working in um, um, Commodities, especially the fundamentalist traders, they're they're really irritated, right? Because they 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 want to trade on what's going on in the real world, but there's so much sort of noise out there coming from these AI machines that are reading news, pricing news, and doing it, and so bringing that bringing their headlines into it before sort of any of it's any of it's been verified. In the book, I, I catalog quite a number of examples of where this whole process got stuff um, drastically wrong. Two thousand. Uh, eight and 2010 with the food price spikes was one. Both years saw record amounts of food produced. There wasn't any, you know, Mad Max style, you know, shortage of, of food or oil or any other commodity in those years. Um, you then begin to see it again after the Arab Spring. They're constantly kind of pricing in oil disruptions that sort of don't arrive. Um, there may even be some of it going on around gas. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not as up on it as, as, as I could be. Um, but yeah, the 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 examples unfortunately just keep just keep coming. Yeah, and I think an interesting one in the book was you were saying, um, obviously, you know, Anne Hathaway, if she won an Oscar, <laughs> if she was in the news, then Berkshire Hathaway would go up, even though there's no link at all. I found that quite funny. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that's right. That's fun. I actually heard that from some, I was interviewing some speculators about it. They would they would bring that up. So if you're listeners. Don't, don't don't know. There's some interesting sort of stuff floating around the internet that people started noticing that um, Anne Hathaway's uh, career was correlated to Berkshire Hathaway's stock price um, by you know just a small amount, a couple of percent this way and that way. And people were kind of reading this. People were, were telling me, you know, what's happening here is the AI is just picking it up. It's just picking up Hathaway, 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 um, and 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 just trading on it. And I thought what was what was interesting about about this and some of the satellite trading stuff I also look, looked at was you would think this new technology would help us overcome the uh, so-called psychological biases or this kind of mania effect that's been written about for, for a very long time. And what I kept finding again and again was actually just made it worse, right? Actually what was happening is they were fine tuning that effect and they were sort of making it more extreme rather than sort of mitigating it. And the reason behind that is, is that the markets don't necessarily reward you for being, um, for, for, for guessing what's gonna happen in the real world. They, they reward you for guessing what the other speculators are kind of moving towards and, and sort of what, 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 what they're betting on. You know, Keynes called it the, the sort of beauty, pa pa the, sorry, I can't talk now. Keynes called it the beauty pageant game, a game in the 1930s. Super sexist and misogynistic, just have to say that because it is, where readers had to kind of guess who was the most beautiful woman and, and they kind of, you know, you, you won the game by guessing what the other readers did. And that's what you're seeing with, you know, satellite trading, AI trading. They're really just about guessing what the other people are doing. They're not, unfortunately, they're not using the technology to actually bend the markets back to reality. Unfortunately, it looks like the technological trends are taking us in the other direction. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, I agree, you know, there's been a centralization of, you know, everyone has the same opinion almost in the markets and it just creates these flash crashes that we've seen um, over the past few years, you know, especially during COVID and, the, and a few other times. And, you know, you mentioned there the 2008, 2010 food price crisis, and there's also oil, I think it was at almost its highest price at, during that time. And you link it to there was obviously the dot-com bubble, which was a crash and almost a lot of these investors, they were looking for diversification. So you link it to the commodity index fund that was created in early 2000s and it, it drastically grew. I think it grew, you know, 10, 10 times almost over five or six years. Um, so can you maybe talk more about that and maybe why these investors were looking to expose themselves to commodities and the impacts that had on the world? Sure. So what was the interesting thing? I, I interviewed um, the Nobel Prize winner, you know, Robert Schiller at, at, at Yale, and he 
he had an interesting take on much of this stuff. Is you can talk about narratives in the way that we have been talking about it. You know, maybe there's a narrative about the rise of China or the rise of the BRICS, or maybe there's a, a narrative about peak oil. And these will sort of narratives will kind of come and go. But you also get narratives that concern investment strategies themselves. And so that I thought it's, it's almost like a meta, it's almost like a meta level of kind of, of kind of thinking about this. Um, and so what you end up getting is you end up getting these uh, narratives among a relatively small number of people, right? These are portfolio managers, they run university pension funds, um, they use union pension funds, for example, big, big, big piles of cash. They're pretty risk averse. These are not people who want to go, you know. Um, betting all the jewels on on race forces, so to speak. They want to do the opposite. They want to conserve money. They want to, you know, get a bit of yield. And in the in the 1990s, it was a pretty simple way to do this. You put money into bonds and stocks, right? Um, to, to put it simply, until of course the stock market crashed, and then you then have this sort of move to diversifying. Um, and I actually think there's a bit in the Sopranos. It could be something else. It was another film. There was something. It was a gangster film or TV show. I remember seeing in the early two thousands, and this sort of mob wife has got all this money, and she goes to see an investor, and she's like, "I want old. I want old. I want anything new. No new technology. I want houses. I want bricks and mortar. I whatever." And then, of course, what happens? Right, the housing bubble. Like right? exactly when the sort of show was coming out, was sort of happening, and that, and that's a good example of how these narratives kind of switch and kind of feed and sort of feed, feed off each other. So you have this one narrative of it's tech, it's stocks. That then flips into something completely different, which is actually, no, we want real things, we want houses, real estate, but also commodities were interesting at that time as well. Um, and then there were then other narratives that were feeding into this. So another narrative was uh, the rise of the BRICS. That was happening now. You know, you've got China, India, Brazil. These are all growing. We want exposure to these emerging markets. Commodity, a lot of them are commodity producers, or they need a lot of commodities. So, so this looks like a, a, a play to get into that. And so you have these different narratives that start swirling around. And the sort of the the, imp, the sort of impact of all of this is you get commodities being turned into an asset and, and, and as a tool of diversification, right? And um, Goldman Sachs and other, and other financial institutions create these derivatives in order to help you do this, right? So you're, I'm sure your uh, listeners have heard of like ETFs or whatever, you have these vehicles that, you know, it can be quite difficult to buy gold or oil, right? When I talk to traders, they used to complain about, you know, you'd actually have to like go and like rent a warehouse and put oil in it. And like, people are lazy or running a pension fund in Wisconsin. You really want to like get into the oil trade and start like stashing oil away. Not really. So these derivative products are very, very convenient. And so it ended up being, ended up being that you get a lot of money kind of, a lot of money started to go into, out of these institutional investors and into commodities. Um, through these new products that were sort of being developed by, 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 the, by the financial institutions. And that I just want to stress is, is just stage one, right? So people sort of get hung up on, 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 on the index fund issue and, and, and commodities, and it's not as big now as, as it was. But I think what's sort of interesting about this is that this commodity story gets kept, kept getting re reinvented each time with a different tool. So it just so happened that in... 2000, you know, in mid, in mid, in mid to, to 2000s, a lot of the money was being driven into these commodity index funds, which were then used to then, you know, purchase futures and so forth. It then flips. So, you know, in 2008, the whole kind of house of cards comes down. A lot of these investors realized they were getting ripped off. These derivatives weren't quite promising what they said they were promising. Um, and then you then get a lot of pension funds actually do go out and start buying land. Harvard University being um, not a pension fund, but a university endowment, another one of these big institutional investors starts buying up land in Australia, South Africa, Brazil, California, um, um, and so forth. And so, so the key point is you have these narratives about, about um, diversification. This then feeds into, in, into commodities and you then get this swell of cash going from people who don't really understand the commodity markets don't really necessarily care about the commodity markets and it ends up messing up the commodity markets, right? It ends up dragging the markets away from what they should be doing, which is feeding information about the real world into the prices and instead starts feeding information about the financial world into the prices. And that's kind of, the, that's just the beginning of the story. Yeah. And I think if we even go back further, you mentioned there was a point where I think it was Greenspan versus someone else. And they're talking about the regulation of derivatives. And how, you know, they were saying that, you know, these derivatives shouldn't be regulated and they should be, I think that was what Greenspan was saying. And that led to this point where, you know, 
there was futures contract, but you didn't actually have to deliver the product. So drastically increase the price of the asset. I don't know if that, I got yeah. that correct. I mean, the, the Greenspan point is interesting because just to, just for listeners, in 1998, there was a famous um, sort of battle of the bureaucrats. It was Alan Greenspan versus Brooksley Bourne, who was then the, uh, the chairperson of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And they were battling over the whole idea of derivatives itself, right? These have been growing in the 1980s, massively accelerating in the 1990s. And there had already been a couple of detonations, right? So Orange County had bought some kind of derivative products that had created billions of dollars in losses. I think Procter & Gamble, I could be a mistake, I think Procter & Gamble also made a trade that they didn't understand and it sort of exploded. And so there was a concern that this new financial architecture that was emerging now is totally taken for granted and built into the system, baked into the cake, so to speak. The 1990s was all very new. Um, and uh, Brooksy Borden decides that she, you know, she actually doesn't even decide to regulate them. She actually releases a, a paper that's asking for input, essentially. So posing a question, should we, these new financial products with a few detonations, you know, should we, should we do something about this? And the Clinton administration reacts very, very negatively to this. So kind of Larry Summers and sort of Greenspan kind of famously team up against Brooksy Board, Brooksy Board and ambush her at this sort of hearing. And this, I kind of went through the transcripts of this hearing and it's totally fascinating to read because in that hearing, you see a vision of what Greenspan thought the future would be. And what's so interesting about it is actual physical commodities are barely mentioned in terms of the future. So Greenspan is essentially saying, look, you know, you Brooksy Bourne, you and the Commodity, F F Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, that's right, I'm getting, I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> CFTC. And, you know, your whole remit comes from speculation on pork and wheat from like the 1920s, right? That has like nothing to do with, you know, credit default swaps, for example. These new credit derivatives that are built around currencies, about securities, around all of these things that don't even exist in the real world, right? So that's kind of Greenspan's entire argument. He's saying like, Look, in the 1920s, yeah, sure, you did have all this crazy speculation on like wheat and pork bellies, but like those are physical things. You could actually put them in a warehouse and like you could control the supply and jack up the price. That at least was kind of theoretically possible, although Greenspan kind of downplays that. Um, and actually he says, look, instead what you have with these new products is like credit default swaps, for example, you know, th these are really insurance products, right? These are making the market safer. We want derivatives, right? It means people can hedge risk. They can spread risk around the world. It's going to make the whole financial uh, system even safer than it is before. This also means, by the way, we don't need Glass-Steagall. So he sort of starts, he actually implores the people around him. He's saying, look, let's scrap all this totally like, you know, um, dated legislation from, from the 1920s. And let's build kind of a new financial world around derivatives. And, and you know, commodities were sort of barely mentioned, but they did end up getting in the financial legislation. They did end up getting in the legislation later. So the actual end legislation had been far more ambitious. And of course, Greenspan was 100% wrong on essentially every single thing that he said. And he actually admitted as much in 2009. He's like, yeah, I was completely wrong about everything. And Greenspan you know, actually showed for an economist some very, very, very rare contrition. But it's a, it's, it's a fascinating episode because you see a window into the world that everybody was being sold and just everything they said was, was completely wrong, even though they won the argument at the time. Yeah, and I talked to um, I, I interviewed um, Ian Fraser a few weeks ago talking about RBS and the collapse of RBS, and they were saying I think the UK was quite similar, where they're saying that we should, you know, trust the bankers to do what's right for everyone. And I think it's funny when you that's almost like Greenspan, like an ideological thinking that you know if we trust them, they're going to do what's right for themselves, for their, well, they did it for themselves, but also for you know their customers and everyone else. But I think that was you know, very very wrong. Absolutely, in that regard. and what's fascinating about Greenspan is Greenspan had that precise argument, right? So Greenspan's whole, whole take was he was like, look, there's gonna be risk, people are gonna make mistakes. Who's better to punish the people, the market or the government? And he essentially thought the market was a better enforcer of discipline than government bureaucrats were. And I think there's a collection of essays by Sir Rand and her followers, like the 60s, and Greenspan makes that precise argument. He had just never developed, he's an amazing example of somebody who had this zero intellectual development his entire life, had the exact precise same, same, same views on 
on, on finance, regulation, free markets, as he did in his in his 20s, as he did as sort of the chairman um, of the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's an elegant argument. It was plausible, but it was also just completely wrong. Yeah, and I think when he, um, you know, we're going a bit off topic here, but when he yeah. uh, bailed out LTCM, which was the ma massive head fund in, I think, 1998, that was really when, there were, you know, these investors like, hang on, if we collapse, they're just going to bail us out. So there's not really any risk. And that was, I think, when you almost took a lot of the risk away from these people and they didn't care as much about maybe the, the rest of the economy. But, we'll, you know, we mentioned their food prices, 2008, 2010, I think that's, I think that's oh, an important point, though. I think that's, I think that's an important point because there's a debate going on right now um, about price controls. And some people think price controls is a good idea. Some people think price controls is a bad idea. And that's all fine. But the reality is we've actually had price controls for a very long time for finance. And so that episode that you're talking about in, in Wall Street, they began to call that the you know, green span put option. Yeah. Which essentially meant, you know, Greenspan was going to guarantee the, the price of financial assets for us. So we were going to have regulation um, or government intervention to help the price of financial assets, just not food prices, oil, things ordinary people use. We're going to leave that to the free market, not to the free market, we're going to leave that to financial institutions, plus a little bit of the free market in their throat, throat, throat in as well. Um, and that policy, by the way, I sort of traced in my book, just sort of Arthur Burns in 1977, during the global, um, the beginnings of the, of the third world debt crisis. And Burns kind of comes in and goes, everyone has to, everyone, by the way, he means by that, poor countries in South America and, and Africa and Asia are going to have to pay back the banks in Britain and the United States, right? You are going to have to do this. We are going to come in and we're going to start batting for finance. Um, and that kind of continues from 1977 all the way through to kind of Greenspan and kind of beyond. So people kind of arguing about, you know, should we be regulating prices? We already have regulated prices. It's just which price are we going to regulate and for who and whose interests? Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, it's, it's hard to see they're not bailing out these massive institutions in the future. But you know, we've seen in the US a spread to other like Boeing and other companies as well. So, and, and airlines and everything with COVID. So it's almost become, <laughs> you know, more and more. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, so we'll go back to sort of the Arab Springs, 2010, 2011, directly mm -hmm. linked to sort of, you know, grain prices almost because it was such a uh, focus of a lot of the, the people, their, their diets, you know, 2014 with Ukraine and Crimea, oil prices were, you know, highest it ever been so it, it's really interesting how you link all these events to prices and just the influence that they actually have on all these events and you know you link it to the past as well and the i think it's france in the 1800s and 1700s you know the bread riots but now it's not actually linked to supply and demand it's more linked to these investment companies and banks yeah it's always a thorny question of, of sort of what's driving prices um the ones that I looked at in particular um, in the in the in in the 2010s, it was at the very least. I think I don't. Nobody would. I interviewed at least would disagree that the prices were amplified, right? So the question was sort of sort of be sort of would sort of be on sort of be on degree. Um, the interesting thing about you know when when you look at sort of um, 18th century France, right? I think it was in the 80 years before the French Revolution, maybe 25, 30 of them had major bread riots, right? This was like super routine, what was happening in France. It's a huge problem for them. And the government there, um, sorry, uh, the sort of the emergence of the modern state in France and much in Europe was actually based around the, about, uh, so it was based around delivering bread, right? Um, one historian calls the king the baker of last resort. Right. So the idea is this kind of stop gap that the kind of the people have between themselves and starvation. And that's the king. And so if the king doesn't fulfill that role, you break the social contract and kind of off with their head, um, which is sort of what happened. Um, we've sort of seen an interesting kind of resurgence of that. Um, one reason is, is that when the colonial empires fell in the Second World War, the new revolutionary government that came in, whether it's kind of Nasser in Egypt or Nehru in India, had kind of, you know, um, bread provision, um, security as kind of the cornerstone of sort of the new social contract. So that kind of quite old French idea of Charlemagne, the Bake of Last Resort, that kind of gets reinvented, if you like, in the, in the, in the, in the post-war period. And so that's sort of why bread becomes so important. It also, it's also important because it has this kind of dual function 
of being both symbol and sustenance. So it's true that a huge amount of caloric intake for many people in the world is kind of wheat based. Um, but also it has this kind of symbolic importance as well. And if you look at photographs of the Arab Spring, for example, you'll see a lot of photographs of people like holding baguettes as guns, holding up bread with kind of protest words that sort are of printed on them. And so these prices have a kind of outsized impact in terms of political legitimacy. You see that in France even, so you see it in advanced economies as well. So in France with the Julie June, um, I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not, protests over fuel. Um, there's some interesting research at the moment that's looking at Biden, approval being sort of inversely correlated to the gas price, the higher the price rises, the more people think he sucks. So you do kind of start spotting these sort of everywhere. And I think, I think the reason why they have such an impact is they have, they have an, an, an ability, prices have this unique ability to kind of sum up the complexity of the world into something very, very simple. And I think it's the kind of simplicity of prices, the visibility of them. You know, you go to the pump, you thought it would be three bucks a gallon. It's now four bucks a gallon. Right? It's, a, it's something which you can observe in your everyday life. A lot of when you see figures around GDP or employment, it will be quite ephemeral. It's all very abstract. The price of food and fuel are very, very real to people. They have very real impacts on people's lives. And so they have this outsized um, impact. The metaphor that I use in the book to how to think about this because um, a lot of people would say to me like, oh, well, you know, Ukraine, it's just because Putin's mad or he's a monster or he's crazed with kind of imperial ambition. And to be honest, I didn't really have a good answer to that because you know, who knows what Putin really thinks? You know, my estimation's as good as the next person's. You know, we can kind of sit on our sofas and kind of become mock psychologists of what all these people are, whether it's, you know, Maduro or Modi or, you know, Putin, pick your pick your person. And so what I decided to do was simply just assume they were all monsters. I was like, okay, let's just have a baseline assumption. They all are terrible people. They all want to invade their neighbors. They want to steal all the money. They want to stash all the money in London real estate. They want to, you know, um, lock all of their opponents in prison. Fine. I'm not going to argue with any of that. Let's just have that as a kind of straw man assumption to operate it with. It's still, even if you think that's true, it doesn't explain when any of things happen, right? Why didn't Putin invade? If he's, so, if he's so set on conquering Eastern Europe, why not do it in 2001? Why did he wait till 2014? And so once you start asking questions like that, you then begin to see that a lot of these um, uh, outbursts of aggression are, are correlated to prices. And so there's a lot of academic research on this um, that's been sort of pioneered um, by, by political scientists. What, one in particular I refer to quite a few in the book is Cullen Hendricks at the University of Denver. It's done quite a lot of the kind of quantitative stuff looking at big, big, big data sets of kind of petro states and kind of conflict. And you see that, you know, as the oil price goes up, so, do, so does the probability um, of conflict. And in some sense, it's sort of obvious, right? Like, yeah, they've got more money, they feel more confident, you know, it, it's harder to slap, to slap. Uh, sanctions on a on a petro state when oil prices are high because you know you need the oil right Germany needs the gas even more so when the price is sort of high and so it, it kind of creates the sort of sense of um, invincibility the sense of power and, and that in, in reality kind of translates into into conflict and so the the argument I sort of push in the book is the way to think about this is kind of this idea of sort of monster and mazes you know, we live in a world of monsters, perhaps we always have, I don't think people today are any worse than people in the past, but what, but, but all these people are all, are all either enabled and constrained by, you know, essentially economics, right, you know, do they have the funds to pay for an army, can they with, can they, you know, do they have the foreign currency reserves to withhold to sort of, um, sort of battle against US or European sanctions, right, and so the way that I see prices is prices are essentially what kind of, um, unlocks the gates, right, and kind of let these sort of monsters sort of roam rampant. And so when the prices are high, these petro states kind of get uncaged and they can kind of go around and do all kinds of sort of nefarious things and the prices go down and then they're kind of better behaved and they're kind of locked back in again until 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 the prices until the prices go up. And so the way to think about prices is, is they have this sort of enabling and, and, and constraining function. Um, on the whole world economy. And because they're global, their effects are global. And that's why we've been seeing all these global trends. Yeah, there's so many good points that you mentioned there just about the prices and <laughs> how it works. So, you know, a lot of the people, countries, I guess you mentioned there were either, you know, author authoritarian, you know, they had these these leaders, these bad people, these monsters, as you said, potentially. Um, 
all the, all they were going through walls that really affected the prices and you know allowed other people to almost take advantage of it you mentioned there was a terrorist who were uh, they had they had this you know they're controlling prices um in one of the countries that you went to do you feel that this could be an issue in other countries maybe you know countries that have you know democracies and and these other countries where it could maybe escalate because i guess we haven't seen that escalation in many other countries over the past hundred years it's mainly been in those totalitarian countries where the, the leaders topple do you think this could maybe be amplified <laughs> Well, the US likes to sort of bomb oil country, oil states um, or, you know, launch coups. I mean, you know, Bush in 2003 was invading Iraq in the name of freedom as he was trying to oust Chavez, the democratically elected, you know, leader of Venezuela, right? It's no coincidence that all of kind of the targets of the US, I, uh, um, probably the exception of Afghanistan, is sort of our, you know, petro states. Um, the US ever since sort of the 1970s, um, in the early 1970s, when they first became an importer of, of, of oil, has really been absolutely kind of critical to their to their foreign policy and their and their support. You know, Nixon going out, you know, repeatedly try and cut deals with Saudi Arabia. Um, so the origin of the US Saudi alliance, which is probably, you know, one of the most important, enduring, and on the face of it, bizarre alliances, right, in the in the entire world. Um, in terms of how these things cascade, sure, they always, they, they cascade. The number one way they do is through refugees, right? So if you've got a war in, if you've got a conflict in Libya or you've got a conflict in Syria, the refugees, first of all, spill over to the, to the neighboring countries and destabilize potentially those countries as well, which often are not, are not rich countries, don't necessarily have massive capacities to sort of deal with them. So that, that's the first Thing of contagion and that's what you saw really at the beginning of the of the uh you know syrian conflict was kind of much more localized refugee effects in the area and of course as time goes on um the refugees start moving um internationally to europe and so that that's kind of for me the absolute critical thing here you've got all of these countries so you've got many many countries around the world that um are dependent in one way or another their security on commodity prices. Maybe it's because they import a lot of food, like the Middle East does. Maybe it's because they export a commodity, say in Central America, like Guatemala exports a lot of coffee. Um, and what these countries find is that when these prices go up or down, that internal stability um, uh, can, can break down quite quickly because they are on this edge of chaos, right? So in Guatemala, I went there as well, if the coffee, you know, per bag, however they were calling it out there, went below $100, you know, you can't pay back your debt. So all these farmers in Guatemala, they finance the harvest on the back of debt from local money lenders, you can't pay. And by the way, the interest is 120% a year, right? So like, if you can't even pay back a small amount of this loan, it's ruinous, and they hold your land deeds for your land. So these very, very small effects, right, it can go from being $100 down to say 98, 95, 90, can create massive, massive human suffering. Um, and then that will then spark my, my migration inside the country to neighboring countries and, of course, internationally. And so when you're thinking about things like climate change, war, pretty much any of these big geopolitical um, uh, crises we're thinking about, the way in which it's going to really reverberate around the world is through um, refugees. And that was one of the key things I wanted to kind of connect to my book is that when we see sort of, you know, kids at the border in the US or refugees coming on, you know, crossing the channel in the UK, the way in which it's reported is that that initial cause, the importance of, of you know, economics and politics is sort of sort of mitigated. It's sort of, sorry, it, sorry, it's, it's, um, it's ignored. What we always need to do is, is understand if you've got listeners there who don't want refugees coming to their country, you know, don't, 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 don't then support policies that are gonna, you know, create instability in those countries, right? If we want, if, 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 if people want their countries, you know, to have low, to have low rates of immigration, then they should stop, you know, fucking with the internal affairs of other people's countries, essentially. That's kind of my lesson I'd like people to take away from it. Yeah, and I think you mentioned, like, you know, as you said, it's been interference from you know, the US and other countries, we've seen that in Venezuela, just with, um, you know, the sanctions that have been put on it. But then you've, you mentioned as well climate, which is another massive factor. So Guatemala, I think they were saying that there's more rain now, which rots the coffee. 
uh, and, and it can grow mold. So that's really impacting their economics as well as in Kenya with the cattle. So I guess that's another risk yeah. that we're seeing as well. So it might not even be able to be controlled economically. It might be this climate disaster that could, you know, drastically change it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the effects of climate change are already happening. So in the book, I have three different case studies of looking at the relationship between climate, commodities, and conflict. Um, I went to Somalia, I went to uh, Kenya, and I went to uh, Guatemala. And each of these places, as I mentioned earlier, are sort of on the edge. Right? This is the way we have to kind of understand, understand the world, is, is, is there's this edge that unfortunately most people live on. And this means you just need small impacts can have big, big impacts. So small impacts can have big effects. So often when you see the movies, right, like um, uh, Armageddon, no, that wasn't one. No, what was it called? Day After Tomorrow. That was it. Day After Tomorrow. That was the big climate movie, a big ice superstorm kind of sweeps the world. Or, you know, the, the Don't Look Up movie, which, okay, it was an allegory to climate change. But again, you've got a big thing. You've got this big asteroid. It's going to come. It's going to kill everyone. I think that way of thinking about climate change in terms of, you know, cities being um, submerged underneath the water, it's fine, like that could happen. I'm not saying New York or Miami or even London isn't gonna be submerged underwater, but we don't need that to happen, for there to be massive, massive, massive impacts. And the reason is because people are living on the edge of chaos. You just need this small, small, small disturbance to create big impacts. You just need the price of food to become just too expensive to create massive migration. You need the price of coffee to go just below the cost of production to create massive migration. And so this is what you're sort of seeing around the world already happening is climate change influencing because the way that climate change having a big impact because the way in which you've decided to organize our society is that people is that people are living on the edge of it and unfortunately the, what what we're doing is actually making all of this worse right so if you if you even if you accept the kind of minimal version of the impact of speculation on commodities, right? Which, which you'll hear from some traders, right? So some traders will be listening to this and going, this is all rubbish, fundamentals drive 95% of prices. And like, that could be, you know, fine. Even if, even if you took that point of view, even that small amount of amplification is still having a big impact on people because, because, because we don't need to have big climate impacts to have, sorry, <laughs> big, big climate shocks to have big human impacts. They just need to be on the edge. So any kind of amplification of that, if it's coming from price, if it's coming from political instability, if it's coming from like crazy po po policies put in by politicians, if it's coming from embargoes, are going to have amplified effects. And then, of course, what also happens is that once the refugees come to certain countries, for example, the UK, the US, the countries I'm more familiar with, you then have um, amplified political responses as well. So that one dinghy of people arriving at the beach on the British coast becomes headline news. Right. So we then have the news media, we have social media algorithms, we have we have another whole set of amplification engines that turn these sometimes sometimes small and always but sometimes small uh, migrations into sort of big political crises and that then creates another effect so you begin to see this these sort of cascading avalanches everywhere right you said and, and it can start with a very very small as i sort of said like climate snowflake and that can kind of land and then the way in which we've organized our societies means that it becomes it can become extremely destructive often in countries thousands of miles away yeah, and I think, you know, when I was reading it, I just thought it was such a more nuanced way of looking at, you know, maybe the climate emergency and how it will affect everyone, rather than, you know, sometimes it's very hard to imagine, like, end of the world, like, as you said, day after tomorrow, it's almost too, too out there to think. But when you look at it, you know, it's already happening now, and just how that, you know, it happened in 2011 to 2014 with the, with the European crisis. So, you know, I think it was a much more nuanced way of looking at prices and climate change and how that can really affect, you know, just everyone around the world. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I, you know, you mentioned all the countries that you've actually gone to, uh, and there was, you know, you went to some crazy places, some, I'm sure they were very dangerous places. Uh, so was there anywhere that really stood out where you just, you know, it was maybe eye opening more than other places? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any question like Somalia was like a completely insane place to go to. Um, it, I, I did an embed with Amazon and 
it was in, in, in some ways the most um, unfortunately unproductive part of the trip because it was too dangerous to like, do anything, right? So even in Iraq, you could, I was sort of in Mosul, um, you know, I think a year or so after the liberation. I mean, it was still dangerous. There's still ISIS, ISIS sleeper cells around. There's still bombs buried everywhere. It's still controlled by this kind of feudal tapestry of like militias, most of whom are sort of backed and sort of controlled by Iran. Um, but even then you can still do stuff. You know, you can still talk to people, you can go out and film. <clears throat> you kind of get a sense of what's happening. In Somalia, you sort of fly into Mogadishu, you're on this airport base. It's this totally bizarre bubble made up of uh, embassies, international organizations, the UN and so forth. That's kind of stripped down the beach. And it's just sort of walled off with these sort of, you know, barbed wire. Although goats kind of climb, climb up and down. So the goats have freedom of movement. The goats kind of come and go as the police. Everyone else is pretty militarized. And then we know you just sit around and wait. So you sit in a hotel room. This hotel was built out of shipping containers. And so you're, you're sitting in the shipping container waiting for the sort of convoy to take you. And then you go. And I went to this town. I wanted to go and talk to people about food security and so forth. And I sort of used to get there. And by the time I got there, the convoy was um, uh, maybe two dozen armored personnel carriers long. I think there were 50 Somali troops with me. So not some, um, sorry, not Somali, sorry, troops from Amazon. They were actually Ugandan troops um, carrying Uzis and machine guns and so forth. And I'm sort of standing there. I'm kind of at the town. We've got there. And um, my sort of handler turns to me and goes, OK, you can't stand still. <laughs> yeah. you're not allowed to stand still you have to keep moving and I was like okay so I was like walking around and you're like okay there's a person hi okay this is a thing okay and then after 11 minutes because I was recording it um it's like all right back in the back in the APC we're kind of we're kind of going back now and then the handler was like this was amazing we captured so much video last time the BBC came we didn't even get out of the cars um so yeah that was that was that was that was pretty crazy um, but it's, I think it's important to go to these places, um, you know, Venezuela, when I went there, right before I left, a journalist said, you will get kidnapped at the airport. Thankfully, I wasn't. Um, and it, it, I think the other thing with these places is, is that there's a two, two, two things about them. You know, one is I had read a lot of the, the research on this. So, you know, my book is not like, you know, breaking new ground in terms of the theories of this. What I was sort of doing was pulling together lots of different studies and threads into kind of one story. And one thing that I didn't like about the previous research that I was looking at was that it didn't, it didn't really make any sense in the sense that you would be reading along and they go, okay, there was the global food crisis in 2008 and like a hundred million people were pushed into starvation. Anyway, and as we move on to the next sentence, you're like, hang on a minute, that's actually like a pretty important point, like 100 million people, like this is, what does this even mean? Um, and I think that's, I think, I think for me, it was really important to be like, okay, well, who are, you know, quote unquote, these people, right? They're real people, they have names, they have families, they have ambitions, they have struggles, the same as everybody else. And that if we're going to be talking about what the impacts of, you know, uh, commodity price shocks are. You really need to hear from the people who are impacted. Um, so so that, was, that was one reason why it was so essential to go to these places and kind of collect all of these stories, um, which in some ways are all totally different and in some ways are all actually totally the same, which was, I think, something really unexpected I got out of the project. Um, and the second thing was, is that often these places are sort of considered to be, um, as I sort of mentioned about Venezuela, kind of like off limits. You know, like, oh, they're just too crazy, you can't go there. And I think that's also doing a massive disservice that will actually live there, you know, who like live there day to day. And like, it's like, they're fine. I'm not, I'm sorry, they're not fine. That's why I went there. But they have to, they have to deal with these risks every day. I don't think it's like crazy to ask a writer or a journalist or a filmmaker who's interested in these things to go and take on the same level of risk as their subjects are and in fact a fraction of the risk really I mean you might be a target because you're a foreign journalist but like you're not living there every day you know most of the time you're living in a hotel that's guarded that's at least relatively speaking safe you know you're not even taking on the risk of the people that you're kind of writing about so I, so 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 for me I think it was the second reason why it was really important to kind of puncture it and kind of get out there and 
and tell the story properly. Yeah, and I think there are some uh, some important messages. So thank you so much for joining the What the Finance podcast talk with me. Um, and just my last question would be, right. you know, what is the message you want people to take away? Would it be those two messages there? Is there anything else specifically you want people to take away? Yeah, from? I suppose the message, I suppose um, the message of the book is relatively simple. It's that the last 10 to sort of 12 years of kind of chaos and instability that um, we've been living with in different forms and to different degrees, um, most of it was actually pretty preventable. And it was actually the result of policies that were only taken relatively recently um, in the 2000s. The kind of these, these price wars, these huge commodity price shocks that have been sending the price of food and oil in particular up and down, just didn't exist in most of the 1980s and the 1990s. Right? If you look at a, the oil price from say 1984 to 2004, it's pretty stable. And by the way, that includes the collapse of communism and two wars in Iraq, right? Like, it's like nothing was happening in this period of time. Um, and so, you know, to sort of go back to kind of this, the so-called sleepy 1990s and 1980s, I think, I think is completely possible. And, and most of what has happened, un unfortunately, was completely avoidable and can be avoided in the future. Yeah, and I think that's, it, it is so true and it's very important messages. So thanks again for joining the podcast. So as I said, the... Uh, the book's released on the 27th and there's a documentary as well as there. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, that's that. right. Later on this year, we've, we've um, already aired it in uh, Germany, Sweden and France um, and the UK version. We're just tweaking a bit at the moment, but hopefully late, later this year. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I'll put everything in the description below. So if you want to buy the book, buy it there. But yeah, th thank you again for joining the podcast. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you are leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.